All right, so for our last fireside chat before we go to afternoon tea, we'll be hearing about swimming outside the flag. It's a bit different to what I was told growing up, um, but I'm very interested to hear some frank thoughts and strong words from the guys today. Before Pay's Chief Operating Officer, Michael Sabara, will talk about growing before pay and offering members instant access to their pay in a way that is transparent, fair and flexible, helping Australians spend smarter, not more, something I think we could all, we could all do, do with. He will also discuss how he attracted capital while nav navigating regulatory uncertainty, as well as what fintechs need from their advisors. Daniel Kreltzheim, who heads up Cornwall's Fintech, Privacy and Emerging Technologies Group, will be our moderator for this fireside chat. Welcome. Thanks very much. Well, as an advisor, uh, a legal advisor, I'm always in awe of um, businesses such as Before Pay, which, you know, if, if it had been easy to do, somebody would have done it already, right? So what we've seen here with Before Pay is an organisation which has gone outside its comfort zone, swum outside the flags, if you will, and that's a bit of a CDR in-joke, but the CDR tragics are probably at the ACCC <laughs> roundtable, uh, so I had to explain it. Um, so what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce you to Michael Sabara, the Chief Operating Officer, as was mentioned, of Before Pay. Uh, part of what I'm in awe of Michael about is his multidisciplinary uh, credentials. So Michael will speak to it, but... He has been a chief technology officer as well as being in charge of the business side as well. So nothing easy is achieved without some sort of multidisciplinary um, interpollination or cross-pollination. And Michael is a living embodiment of that. So I think I've said enough. Um, welcome, Michael. Can you talk a little bit about yourself first? If you don't sure. Mind? Thank you. Very flattering introduction indeed. Um, so Michael Savaya, chief operating officer before pay. Uh, as David mentioned, um, I've split between consulting and startup my entire life, um, consulting for both PricewaterhouseCoopers as well as McKinsey and Company most recently, and then split between uh, different executive roles at different startups, uh, formerly CTO of an IoT startup as well as an augmented reality startup that was on the stock exchange, and most recently uh, Chief Operating Officer before pay. Uh, it's good to have, I think, the engineering background combined with the business management background, especially in something as complex as a fintech. Thanks, Michael. And now, swimming outside the flags, um, can you just tell us a little bit about the growth tra trajectory of Before Pay and how you reached where you are right now? Yeah, um, it's been a pretty exciting ride, to be fair. I've only been here for a part of it nine months, but Before Pay was founded at the end of 2019, which was a precursor to um, our favourite last year of lock-ins, COVID. Uh, the app was built over the COVID period and was sort of in stasis till about September of 2020, at which stage it was ready to go. Um, at that stage, it was four employees who were a part of the core team. I joined as number five, as actually chief product officer at the time. Uh, since then, we've scaled those four people to 30 in about six or seven months, hiring three or four people every month. Uh, we raised 25 odd million dollars and we've... Uh, successfully uh, had over 300,000 downloads. Um, it's really only just re reaching fever pitch now, but um, it's an exciting road ahead. Uh, in terms of sort of battling the regulatory component, uh, what actually inspired the company in the first place was the, an exemption in what's called the, um, the uh, Consumer P Credit Protection Act. Uh, we worked out that we could make a far more engaging uh, and transparent product Millennials have typically fallen out of favour with credit cards. I think only about 5% of our user base actually have a credit card. Uh, but using the exemption in this act, we could create the Before Pay brand, which is a 5% fixed fee on your wage advance. Thanks, Michael. And from an advisor's perspective, one of the things we learn from organisations like Before Pay is uh, to, to help develop solutions rather than, you know, say no and be a kind of a, a roadblock to... Uh, a viable business plan. So all credit to Before Pay for uh, spotting and navigating the exemptions and working through it. Um, are you able to talk a bit more about, you know, the cross um, multifunctional team aspect of what you do? Yeah, so 
I think fintech's a pretty interesting comparison to your usual SaaS startup. It's not like you can just go and sign up to some Google APIs, build a platform and release it. Uh, when you're dealing with fintech, you're dealing with a bunch of weird technologies and you need a bunch of subject matter expertise, which is hard to come by. Um, banking platforms notoriously are antiquated beasts. They're incredibly hard to integrate with. But also the consequences of getting it wrong are remarkable when you're dealing with people's money and people's incredibly sensitive, personally identifiable information. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, yeah. that's fine, Michael. And just obviously as part of, can you describe the before pay model uh, in a bit more detail? Just to what, how your model works and how you offer the consumers uh, the product and so on? Yeah, so uh, the way that we work is you sign up very quickly via our app. We pride ourselves on being one of the fastest decision makers in market, uh, only taking a couple of minutes from getting the app to actually getting your first cash out. Uh, during the sign up process, we synchronize with your bank. Uh, we build a model of your transaction history. Um, and then in doing so, we get a very strong picture of your current financial situation, what we can uh, reasonably advance to you, and also how to best structure your repayment schedule such that we're generally solving a proper customer problem. I think I can't emphasize enough how Before Pay distinguishes itself as being incredibly customer focused. We're not just here to give money away, we're here to help tide you over. Most of our customers uh, use this money for things like groceries when their car breaks down. Uh, it's important that we're, you're not stuck in a debt cycle. We're generally trying to fix a problem here. Thanks, Michael. And Michael, you mentioned uh, the synchronizing with the bank accounts, and I think these are good opportunity to then move into the the more in uh, in joke meaning of swimming outside the flags, which is s many of you in the room might know, but in the C CDR Future Directions uh, report, one of the analogies was um, how the government was not encouraged to be prescriptive um, in prohibiting in an outright way screen scraping, at least for read-only access, and um, the the view was that you know, consumers should be given a way to swim between the flags, but there wasn't any rule to preclude consumers from swimming, swimming outside the flags, as it were. So that's a long-winded way of saying um, there is this sort of dichotomy, and I know Michael will talk to it, between swimming outside the flags for the consumers, i.e. the current uh, synchronization mechanism through uh, so-called so screen scraping versus transition to a more regulated, uh, rigorous uh, consumer data right. Michael, can you talk to that? Yeah, so uh, CDI, uh, speaking on the note of like customer centricity, CDI is probably one of the most customer centric pieces of legislation that we're really looking at. It's a whole philosophy on how we should be enabling customers as much as possible with their own data. Uh, selfishly, companies abuse and misuse data, but the power needs to be put back in the consumer's hands and uh, Take it how you will, but this is actually better for everyone. It improves uh, mobility between products for customers. It creates a far more interoperable and seamless um, economic situation in which people can jump between companies. People can reuse data. If, if everyone is familiar with the single sign-on with Facebook or you sign up to an app that pre-populates your data, we have to think about CDR in the same way. Bank scraping tries to do the same thing, and it's the current approach. Um, however, there, there are a few issues with it, obviously. The stability first and foremost, is a concern. Uh, it's an inconsistent customer experience, and the fidelity of the data is not always trustworthy. But more importantly, that on a data governance and cyber security note, uh, handing over your bank credentials is a somewhat concerning process, and you have to trust that the organization has your best interests in mind, are storing those credentials in a safe and secure way, and are also going to delete your data. You have the right to be forgotten at the end of the day, and you have to trust the organization once you're displeased with their service and want to leave them are also going to forget you. Um, CDR takes it to completely the other end of the spectrum. I, as a CDR person, can give before pay my data in as little or as much granular access as I want. The moment I don't want it to be there, it doesn't have to be there. Uh, it creates a superior customer experience as you can jump between products, and uh, it creates uh, just far more opportunities, most interestingly, international ones, potentially. So CDR has the ability to share data unilaterally with other nations which fall under similar regimes, such as the UK and New Zealand. Right now, Australia is a net importer of financial services, but this will give us the opportunity to safely become an awesome net exporter and enable both foreign opportunities, but also Australians in foreign nations. Thank you, Michael. 
Michael, it might be an unfair question, but um, in terms of engagement with the CDR, can you share any thoughts about how before pay might go about it? Yeah, so look, so that's quite complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology is quite nascent at this stage, uh, and the way that the banks have rolled it out has not uh, been the best. I think there's still a few complexities to be sorted. And there's certainly not a t-shirt sizing or one size fits all in terms of how people should take the journey. Uh, obviously, um, for those of you unaware, you have to go through a multi-stage audit process. That audit can cost north of $70,000, can take three to six months, and also requires quite a deep level of uh, uh, expertise in both technology and infrastructure. Um, from a before pay perspective, we look at the full spectrum of opportunities, everything from build to buy to partner. Uh, right now, we're still deliberating on what the best way to deliver that for before pay is. I'd say for startups now, they're considering the process. Uh, there are three main things that you should really be looking at. First and foremost, what's your business model? Um, the way in which data is consumed uh, through, a through an open banking model, uh, your high volume, low, uh, low margin, low volume, high margin. Um, secondly, what kind of in-house expertise and funding do you have? You need a pretty severe team to support this kind of infrastructure. Ultimately, I imagine open banking will uh, be evangelized and become a far more accessible technology. Um, and then more broadly than that, um, uh, how do you feel about your consumers at the end of the day? Uh, do you want to have really tight knit control over the data or do you just want to um, take it from an accredited data holder? Um, towards the end of the year, we're going to come to a conclusion on this, but uh, I think we're sort of a maverick in the space in a sense. Thank you, Michael. Michael, that's all been really very illuminating. Thank you so much. Um, I might actually, unless you want to add anything before we throw open to questions, I might... Are you happy for me to throw yeah, questions please. now? Please, any questions uh, of Michael? If you could describe your growth in one word, what word would that be? Stellar. Ooh, no hesitation. Great question. Any more Dorothy Dixes? <laughs> Any more questions like that? <laughs> Does anyone know a good joke? Michael, I might ask you another one, which is, I, I did touch on this whole aspect of, as from an advisor's perspective, how certainly what I've found is advisors through training and temperament, I'm, I'm talking about lawyers, but accountants probably fall into the same uh, category as well. Um, through training and temperament, we tend to be cautious, and it's sometimes really quite challenging to uh, know how to advise uh, uh, an organization such as Before Pay appropriately. And we try our, we try our best, um, but is there any guidance you can give to the advisor community as to what we should watch out for or uh, be mindful of? Yeah, look, um, boating to what I said before that uh, fintechs are not the same animal as your usual SaaS startup, I think there are two real things that advisors need to be aware of. One is around the complexity of technology that cannot be understated. Banking systems are weird, they're scary, and when they go wrong, they go really wrong. Uh, in my experience with my other startups, there's always been massive pressure from shareholders, investors, advisors, just to get a product out of market, uh, put a line in the sand uh, at any cost. Uh, but the consequences are dire out of fintech. So I think advisors are best positioned to understand the kinds of challenges which are going to happen with rolling out a product, uh, the kinds of challenges that are going to happen when you're sourcing the right talent to support and facilitate the rollout of that product. Uh, and also the technology decisions underlying it are not ones where you can necessarily just use best practices. You may be well inventing those best practices. Uh, secondly, from a regulatory perspective, uh, not enough emphasis can be put on getting the right advice. And advisors are not expected to know everything. Uh, but helping source those insights is incredibly important. Australia is a really funny one when it comes to all the regulatory bodies. Uh, they don't always operate in the same way. They can of often have conflicting intentions. Uh, even worse than that, they are, they're very fragmented. There's no single source of truth. In Singapore, for instance, we have the 
uh, Singaporean Money Authority, which is the single source of truth that a startup can go to and understand the entire regulatory landscape and get solid advice. By contrast, in Australia, we have APRA looking after deposit-taking institutions. We have Austrac looking after anti-money laundering and terrorism. We have uh, Reserve Bank looking at payments. Uh, notoriously and anecdotally, people will go to um, uh, like APRA workshops and try and get some advice on where they stand and they'll never get the same piece of advice twice. Uh, if advisors can help find good sources of insight which are not just antiquated banking bodies, uh, that's incredibly helpful in making sure that uh, your business model is going to stand the regulatory test, uh, test of time. Thank you, Michael. Well, arising out of that, are there any questions? Hi, Michael. Um, I think one of the most exciting parts about FinTech is that you know it needs to give access to all type of different type of people, and especially when it's consumer facing, it's all well and good if you're an individual who has identification and can access those um, technologies. But is there anything that before pay is doing to make sure like people who m might not have the traditional identification or um, ways to identify themselves can access your services? Yeah, look. That's a really complex one at the end of the day. Um, fundamentally, we have to be very concerned about know your customer, KYC, and AML, anti-money laundering. Uh, certainly, the whole KYC process is probably one of the more complex parts of the before pay onboarding process. Uh, we use everything from driver's licenses to Medibank cards, but fundamentally, um, access to credit, I think, needs to be carefully controlled, giving it to the right people and delivering it in the right way. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and just to add to that, I guess because there's reliance on bank accounts, by definition we're talking about a population which has a bank account which um, can be accessed for the purposes of the uh, product. Uh, but the good thing in Australia is that there's a very strong penetration of bank accounts and we're um, and heavily banked as individuals and we don't have many people who don't have access to a bank account, which is fortunate and a credit to our community. Um, Michael, I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us for giving us your time and your insights. Uh, it's been fabulous and encouraging and we're still strapped in to see how the stellar growth continues. So congratulations and can you all join me in thanking Michael? Oh, sorry, there's one more question. I beg your pardon. Yeah, sorry, I'll probably go to... Uh, <laughs> so, so first question is regarding more probably UX. Oh, sorry, my name is George from Nubil. Um, so ba basically before, uh, because your, uh, your business model is offering credit to people, obviously there will be customers that cannot get that credit. Um, how do you keep them happy? Like how do you keep them keep engaged? So that's probably the first question. Um, the second question is, obviously, you grow really, really fast. Um, and how do you keep the balance between growth and the raise capital? Basically, you need a lot of capital to, to learn, learn it out and also grow your systems. Um, ha and, and you know, basically, if the founder and the team focus on the uh, capital growth, uh, sorry, capital raising, then they may not have need enough time for the market growth. So how do you balance it out? Thank you. Um, if I can clarify your second question, you're talking about how do you balance time between operational activities and capital raising activities? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, to answer your first question, yeah, uh, it is a challenge when people aren't eligible for credit. Um, before Pay is all about holistic financial well-being, so we also engage people via our PFM tool, our personal financial management, which is budgeting and saving. Uh, hopefully, our goal is to always get someone into a state at which they become credit worthy uh, and essentially de-stress and enable them financially. Uh, admittedly, it is hard to engage given that uh, the wage advance component is the primary proposition, um, but we're continuing to grow out our offerings to people well beyond that. Um, to answer your second question in terms of balancing um, capital raising activities and balancing operating activities, it's a mean feat, I'll, I'll admit that. Um, time often drawn between having lots of pretty mundane conversations with uh, brokers and other entities like that, but also having to come back to the office and make sure that things are running smoothly, your product is being delivered, uh, you're talking to the customer as much as possible. Um, I'd say we're very fortunate before pay with uh, our CEO, Tarek, who uh, is an impeccable uh, front of the company. He's, he's very much able to navigate these conversations and we have a brilliant working relationship in which um, I'm the stay-at-home mum, so to speak, the stay-at-home dad. 
and I <laughs> make sure things stick along while he goes and uh, totes the company in a great way and keeps the money rolling through the door. Well, fantastic. Thank you again, Michael, and thanks, everyone. I don't want to stand between you and afternoon tea, so thanks very much. Thank you.